Hello, we are so glad you could join us. Welcome to Renewal Church Online. My name is Mike Kubai, part of the team here at Renewal, and we are so glad you could join us. Before we get into the worship, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to engage with you in your word and in song. We open up our hearts to receive what you have in store for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy. You are on your throne. You are not alone. 
up. Somebody give a mighty shout to Jesus right now.
Join us at Hidden Gardens this Friday, the 25th of August, for a night of Afro Beats worship. Come and join us as we sing, dance, and praise our Lord in a fresh way. The time is 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. You don't want to miss it. Come and make yourselves right at home. The people who are on this sofa have vacated it, so if you want to steal it, please go ahead. Just move forward. Go on, Esther, just grab the sofa. All right, guys, as we start, I'm just going to pray for us tonight. God, we thank you that you are, you are God. As we sung earlier, you are God alone. And I pray as we just uh, dwell tonight, as we just think and reflect, and open our hearts, our ears, our minds, our our senses to what you're saying. Would you speak to each one of us? Lord, from those who are deeply bought in to those who are deeply skeptical and everyone in between, we just ask that you would make yourself known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, if you've got a Bible, I'd love you to turn to uh, one of the history books in, in the front of the Bible called uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 8. Uh, if not, don't worry, I'm going to read it out, um, so you'll be able to, to listen along to that. 1 Samuel chapter 8. For those of you who've been with us, we've been going through this series uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, which is one of the first kind of, it chronicles part of the, the story of the Israelites. Um, a wonderful, wonderful story. And we come to this kind of iconic moment tonight. Uh, where we look at uh, something that changes the narrative of, of Scripture in a massive way. Uh, so we're going to dig into that in just a moment. For those of you who, who noticed, I've been away. Um, for those of you, someone was kind enough to say, Chris, we heard you were at the beach, but you've come back looking whiter than when you went. What's wrong with you? This is as brown as I go, guys, okay? So please, I would, I'd love some encouragement later on if you, if you would be so kind. This story, 1 Samuel chapter 8, let me read this out. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. They said, give us a king to lead us. And this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods that so they are doing it to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to his people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. They're going to die, is what he's saying, some of them. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations. We're the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. There's a fascinating moment in, in the story of God's people. 
And I want to reflect really briefly tonight um, about what about when the story doesn't go the way you want it to go? What about when the story doesn't go the way you want it to go? I think it'd be really easy to think if you look at kind of social media or if you look at portrayals of, of Christians that being a good Christian and doing the right thing means the story goes the way you want it to go. But, I, but I'm not sure about that. I've been a Christian quite, quite a long time now, at least sort of, I guess, 25 years or so. I became a Christian when I was one, obviously. I'm joking. I was two. Um, but I've been a Christian for a while. And, do you know, I've, I've tried to learn a few things along the way, but this is the number one thing I've learned. God prefers it when he is boss of the universe and not me. He thinks it's better that way around, but also that I'm really slow to learn this. I'm really slow to learn that God's meant to be in charge and I'm not. And so I keep trying to like be in charge and be in charge of things. So really quickly, in the arc of the narrative of the Bible, this story is huge. We, we start out in Eden, in Genesis 1, right at the beginning, God's presence with his people uh, in Eden. And then Adam and Eve fall, and they're banished from the garden. They're banished from God's living, active presence. And later in the story, God meets with Abraham, and he speaks with him, and he promises um, Abraham that through his family, he'll be, there'll be a blessing to the people. There'll be a light to the nations of who God is. And in these Old Testament um, kind of figures of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, we see a family begin to become a nation. And they were defined by one thing. They were defined by their relationship with Yahweh, with God. And they end up in Egypt where they have favor and position. But eventually there comes a time when they, when they fall from being welcome in the land to being slaves in the land. And they begin to cry out to God. And God sends Moses to come, and he comes in God's strength and power to lead them out of Egypt so they can go back and worship God. And they eventually make it to the promised land. They're led there by Moses and then into the land by Joshua. But after Joshua, it says in the Bible, it says that there arose a time when no one knew Yahweh or the things that he'd done. So God raised up what are called judges or rulers, if you will. And it was their role to lead people back to God. It was their role just to lead people back to God. And they were chosen by God to remind them of who God was, the God of the world, the creator of the universe, the one who'd rescued them. And we step into the story at this moment on the back of a bunch of judges. And Samuel's kind of been the last of these judges or rulers bringing the people back to God. And the people reject what God has given them. You see, it wasn't that God didn't want them to have a king. He was saying, no, no, I am your king. You already have a king. He's Yahweh. He wanted to be their king and he wanted to raise up earthly leaders, not to be their kings, but to remind them, to point them to who God was, to remind them of God's story. And in this story, we see something really curious about God. It's kind of like, God, I, I thought this was your plan. I thought it was your plan to not have a king. I thought that was your plan. And then all of a sudden, things seem to be going wrong. This isn't what you wanted, is it, God? This isn't, doesn't seem to be what you wanted. And Samuel's in that place of going, God, this isn't what you wanted. This, the, have you seen what the people have asked for? This is outrageous. And even Samuel going, God, I thought this is what you wanted of me. But apparently not. I wonder what it makes you think when the story doesn't go the way you expected it to. As I've talked to a number of you, and I feel this in my own life, at a very kind of human level, we feel that somehow the story's not gone the way we kind of felt it should. Or maybe even that we felt that God had told us it would. I was, you know, some of you would say to me, I was told growing up if I did well at school, if I got these qualifications, then I'd get this job and this car and this partner would come along. And it didn't. 
if I was good and I went to church, then things would be okay. And they're not. I deeply desire this, and I thought God deeply desired this for me too. But I'm not there, and it hasn't happened. The job, the baby, the marriage, the whatever the blank might be for you. So as we kind of wrestle with this, I wonder, as we look going, God, so what does it mean when this story seems not to be the story I thought it was meant to be? Well, I'm going to just offer some reflections I see in the text on that. And firstly this, we need to have a faith bigger than things going right. We need to have a faith bigger than things going right. I wonder how many of us have a faith dependent on God doing what we think we need him to do. On the moment it doesn't, our faith crumbles. In this story, Samuel is doing what he feels God has called him to, and he knows that God does not want them to have a king because God is their king. And Samuel is struggling with this story. You know, they talk about different types of faith. You know, we say we have like a religious faith is if I do this, if I do these things, then good things will happen. Like if I tick the right boxes, if I go along to church, if, I, if I'm part of this, if I serve in this, whatever, and they're all good stuff. It's not I'm wrong with that. But they, this is just if I do these things, then this will happen. And then also we have like this faith of desperation. So I'm in need of this. So I'll have faith for something to happen. Kind of that idea of like faith of a mustard seed will, will change things. Faith to believe things can and will happen. This is brilliant. It's beautiful. But there's a, another level of faith, I think, than believing God for the miraculous. More than believing God for a particular outcome, I think we need to learn a faith of surrender deep kind of faith, more than believing in God for an outcome, this is believing in God. This is Jesus saying, not my will, but your will be done. This is Job at the end of all his trials and tribulations going, I don't get it, but you're God and I'm not. This is Paul in prison saying, to live as Christ, to die as gain, I pray that I would glorify Jesus in whatever. And this doesn't mean we don't have desires for particular outcomes. It's not saying we kind of switch off the things that we want. But we're not simply attached to these desires. And this is a level of faith that's not just dependent on God's response to us. I love that story in in the book of Daniel. And they're about to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they say, if you'll bow down and, and worship our gods, then we won't put you in. And he says, no, no, no. You know, our God could rescue us from this, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship your gods. Like I said, I've just got, um, just got back. And while I was away, I just had to process some things that I deeply cared about. Some things that I felt God had asked me to do. Some things I I thought God had really laid on my heart, really given me a vision for, that weren't coming to fruition. And actually aren't going to come to fruition. Things that I'd longed to do and be a part of, and the things that I felt God had wanted me to do. And going, God, what did I miss? What did I get wrong? I was with someone recently, and they said they'd been asked by God to do something, and it hadn't happened, but they felt God say, I didn't promise you the outcome. I asked you to be faithful. And I think there's a real difference there. Samuel had to learn this faith of surrender to God's ideas. God doesn't always give us what we think. He asks us to do things, but he doesn't promise the results. I wonder where God is asking us just for a faith of surrender on things. Not like indifference or apathy, but when we do what we're meant to do and we let God take care of the rest. Okay, secondly this. If we don't look to God, it can be easy to forget where he is in our story. 
if we don't look to God, it can be really easy to th- forget where he is in our story. So these people were busy looking not to God and not to their king, but they were looking at the other nations. And they took their eyes off God, who'd promised to be all that they needed. And they began to look elsewhere. And look at what confusion it brings to them. God basically says, you'll lose your agency. You'll lose the best of your food, your crops, your people. You'll become slaves and worse. And they go, sure. Give us a king. I can just imagine Samuel going, are are you serious? Are you so stupid? You know, in our moment, it's possible to not simply look at our, sim- our situation but, and to resist simply looking at others and to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. I wonder if that's possible. Or does the situation feel overwhelming? It feels like the thing we should be looking at. I wonder where the narratives of our time, the cultural narratives of our time, take over what God might be saying to us. How do we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? Are we waiting? Are we in prayer? Are we opening our Bible? Are we reminding ourselves of God's story and what he's done for us? Are we in community with people who are going to walk with us? Thirdly this, there is a deep need for the presence of the Father. We live in times that where We see darkness around us. We only need to look onto our news feeds to see that, to feel it. The darkest story in our country perhaps this year has centered around the church in Shakahola. And we, and you know, I was away this week and someone said, what do you do? I said, oh, I work for a church. And went, ooh. When I'm down the coast, people are like, ooh, you work for a church. There's been rioting on our streets, job and money pressures, and we feel it. There's some deep darkness in our time. And Samuel's frustration is because the people are missing what he learned earlier in the, the book. If you go back a few, a few chapters, you see Samuel learn that the thing we need is the Father's presence to lead us. We mustn't read that Samuel is trying to protect his position, but rather he's trying to remember that life is fueled by the presence of the Father. We have... Um, my wife, Abby, and I, we have three young kids. And they've had, at different times, very bad sleeping habits. So what I really prayed for when they were born is that they would sleep from about 6 in the evening till about 8 the next morning. I thought that would be useful. Apparently, that isn't how it works. Um, and our kids, just at varying times, would just be up in the middle of the night. And um, they often, I often hear them crying out like on on the baby monitor I remember them crying out and they would start by because for some reason they would start by saying mama first because she's more lovely than I am but very quickly they realize she's going nowhere (laughs) she is fast asleep she's not going anywhere so eventually like papa papa and in that kind of loving fatherly way that I had I would kind of like turn over and put a pillow over my head and try and ignore that it wasn't happening eventually kind of go in and sit with them. I remember at one point we'd been on on safari and they'd seen um, bat-eared foxes. You know what I mean? Like the bat-eared fox, beautiful creature. So they were convinced in the middle of the night in our house that we had foxes in the house. I said, don't worry, there's only one fox in this house and that's your mama. Uh, I'm only joking. I nicked that joke from someone. But... They were so worried. They were like, I think there's something scary in this house. And they would wake up and they'd be like, do you just want to come? I remember one night Wilbur waking up. It's like three in the morning. It's like, I just think the only thing that would help me is to play. I'm like, it's three, it's three in the morning. Why don't we play at sleeping? Um, and I just remember thinking, wow, this is really big for them. And it was dark. Do you know, it's really important to know that even if you know the light is going to return, the dark can be really scary. Even if you know that the light is coming in, the dark can be really scary. And the thing that can really help in the dark is the presence of the Father. And I I would lay down. 
next to my daughter. I remember my daughter, she insists on it being dark, but uh, there were times where she didn't like the dark, and she'd we'd lie there in the dark. I'd be next to her, and she'd reach out a little hand, and she'd stroke me on the face like this. And I'd be like, Corey, I'm kind of asleep. And she'd just rub my face like this, and she'd say this, Papa, is your face turned towards me? And I'd say, Corey, my face is always turned towards you. And as I read this in the book, this is kind of like, sometimes we get so lost from the, the narratives around us that we forget that God's face is turned towards us and the Father's presence can make the dark seem like we can get through it. The antidote to the pain and fear of the dark isn't just awaiting the light, but it's the presence of the Father. In the moment we live in, I wonder how do we respond to darkness not with thinking, not with better structures and systems, but a need for the Father's presence. So I encourage you guys, come along on Friday night because we just want to worship and we just want to be in the Father's presence. And then finally this, God is in the business of taking our brokenness and making it part of his story. This, by any accounts, is a broken part of the story. They've rebelled against everything that God had kind of hoped for. I don't know if any of you are into the Star Wars movies. Um, Mark Hamill, the kind of glamour boy playing Luke Skywalker, between the first and the second films, had a car crash. A really serious car crash. Huge uh, cuts to his faces and stuff. And he turned up rather nervously to the first day of filming for the second film thinking he might be dismissed and that they might not want to use him. And the rumors are that George Lucas took one look at him and walked away and went and rewrote the script for the start. And if you see the start of that film, now you see the scarf around his face and then he gets attacked. And later you see the scars on his face. He took the brokenness of one of the actors and made it part of the story. And we see in here a deeply troubled moment where the people who, who Samuel had given to lead uh, and, and bring people back to God had turned to dishonest game, accepted bribes, they perverted justice. They weren't following the ways of God in a deeply troubled moment. God steps in into a story that he doesn't want to happen, that he doesn't want them to just have a king whenever they want. But he chooses to make it part of his story. And he uses this line of kingship to usher in the Messiah. And God takes our broken stories and uses it to be part of his story. And as we wrap up, I wonder kind of where you are on this story. I want to go back to where I started with my own kind of failings and learnings. And you know, I want to be honest, a lot of the time I feel really underqualified and quite frank, frankly a bit too broken to be a follower of Jesus and, and too kind of messed up to be involved in the story. But as we read this and as we see this account, this kind of um, type of story again and again, in the brokenness, if we allow God to move, this is often the place he does his best work. One of the things I have noticed about God is he, he doesn't work in the midst of perfection and neatness. Largely because he can't find it. Because we're not like that. But he does choose to work in and through us. Guys, we're just going to respond uh, in this. I'm going to ask Chikwaza and the guys to come back up. But as I was praying, I just sensed that there might be people in here going, this story doesn't look like I thought it was meant to do. I thought I was meant to be doing this. I thought God had asked me to do this. And I wonder how you're dealing with that. I just want us to, to pray over one another for that. So guys, will you stand with me wherever you are? Maybe as you sit, sit or stand tonight, you're like a bit confused by the story. 
Like, God, I thought this was going to happen, and it hasn't. I thought this was meant to be the thing, and it's not. I thought when I turned to you, things would be okay, and they're not. And I'm feeling the pain, and I'm feeling the struggle. And if that's you, if you're feeling that tonight, and by the way, I I am, so I'm definitely going to ask someone to pray for me in a minute, but if that's you, we would just love to pray for you. So maybe just as a sign of saying, God, I want to I want to receive some prayer and I want to hear from you tonight. Maybe just put your hands out in front of you. Saying, God, I'm not sure where you are in this story, but I want to hear your voice. I want to know you're real. And if there are people around us who've got their hands out, guys, can we just turn and pray for them? tonight so let's just let's just be family on mission here so if you love Jesus and you have a pulse you're qualified for the prayer team tonight that doesn't mean we we devalue prayer it just means there's a number of people need prayer tonight they don't have to be say anything special or anything fancy but just just stand with them ask them what they'd like you to pray for they don't, they don't even have to tell you just just stand with them and start praying Say, God, we'd love you to show yourself. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you remind us of what you're doing in the story? Would you remind us of your presence, even though it feels a bit dark for some of us?
Jimmy. 